Good morning. It's been a great uh, morning already uh, with a lot of uh, commentary that kind of sets the stage for some of what we'd like to talk about now. Um, because it, I don't think anybody here you know, doubts the statement that this is a powerfully geopolitical environment that we now have uh, for the energy sector. Things are happening in China, things are happening in Russia, the Middle East, uh, and all with implications for North, the North American continent as well. And so what we'd like to do is uh, recognize some of those factors and, and try to address some of the elements of chaos, and we couldn't have a better uh, party to address it than our one-person panel here. Um, uh, Admiral Ruff, uh, uh, Ruffhead uh, was going to be here, but had some uh, geopolitics, I suspect, that drew him away. And, uh, but I think we can really get into it as well. What I'd like to do is very briefly set the stage by characterizing how I see a few of these areas and the, the drivers that are at work and then get into what the second order implications of all that might be um, uh, as, we, as we go forward from here. Um, in terms of China, it's clearly undergoing uh, a historical transition, uh, one that I was witness to in the early uh, 1980s as Deng Xiaoping uh, really transformed the country with an attitude that it's okay to uh, foster economic growth and, and wealth create creation, uh, and it was a, it was a great run. Uh, but clearly the transition now involves uh, something of, uh, while exports will still be important, uh, that transition to more of a consumer economy domestically and uh, with a high priority on preserving one party rule. All kinds of consequences to that. Uh, I, if you think of politics as yet another market, and you talk about one party rule, you're almost talking about an oxymoron in terms of competitiveness for that market. And, um, and as we're seeing, and not surprisingly, uh, that has implications for the rate of, uh, of growth in China uh, yet to be dealt with. Japan uh, is locked into a disturbingly economic uh, state of stagnation and has given us in recent times a real case study uh, in chaotic energy disruption as a consequence of their, uh, of their unfortunate disaster uh, with nuclear power. India, uh, Indonesia, and much of the rest of, uh, uh, of Asia dealing with knock-on effects from what's going on with their neighbors and their own challenges with population and the needs of those population. A lot of that being addressed by some of our prior speakers. Russia, under Putin, where energy is, is, a, is an option, uh, and some would say a weapon, uh, and especially if you're under the pressures and the sanctions that he's under, uh, uh, talking about the chaos that uh, can be either instigated or taken advantage of uh, becomes important. And I left you know, the most chaotic for last, perhaps, uh, mm -hmm. what's going on in the Middle East, the morphing uh, into what uh, some would cl classify as as, a, uh, as a, the equivalent of a Cold War, maybe in the offing, at least the notion of it, between Saudi Arabia and Iran, um, and uh, with all that may imply as, a, as an analog in terms of uh, subterfuge and, and actions and reactions, but it, against an even more complicated backdrop, perhaps, than we saw in our Cold War with Russia uh, in, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, one where you've got the other dimensions besides the, the polarity between those two countries I've just mentioned. You've got what's going on in Syria with all of its enemy of my enemy is, um, is my friend, except as Henry Kissinger recently uh, observed. Uh, that rule may not apply today because the enemy of my enemy may not be my trustworthy friend, uh, as he did in a very fine uh, uh, assessment of that situation not, not long ago in an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. So against that, I'd really like us to just talk a little bit about this and perhaps come back or start with the, what I finished with, uh, Russia uh, and the assessment of it in terms of the range of, of chaos that we're dealing with and, and what might morph out of this as we see Russia under sanctions, uh, dealing with 
uh, some reason to believe its energy capability at this point um, is, uh, is maybe right at the point where he doesn't have as much optionality as he might have thought he had three years ago. Yeah. Um, to, to start with Russia, um, Russia is a revanchist power. It's not a resurgent power. I was on Morning Joe eight, nine months ago, and Scarborough asked me, and I said, you realize, Joe, he's doing all this with nothing more than a pair of sevens in his hand? Okay. Uh, and, and has I, yet to be called and I, and I could not avoid the political <laughs> comment, and somebody needs to call the pot, otherwise he's, you're going to continue winning without, without any picture cards. Um, President Obama's right. Uh, a lot of Russian behavior we're seeing right now is based on Russian weakness, not Russian resurgence. Um, running out of democracy, running out of entrepreneurship, running out of oil, running out of gas, and fundamentally, running out of Russians. Um, th this is a dramatically declining population, uh, irreversible for two or three generations. In fact, um, the, the, the Russian state's efforts to reverse it are on the wrong end of the equation. They're, they're, they're trying to push procreation when, when the real problem with the declining population is uh, life expectancy to give you some measure of quality of life. And the primary causes of death uh, of Russian males are violence, automobile accidents, and substance abuse. So it gives you some measure of the problems he faces. I don't think the Russian Federation is the problem we imagine it to be in seven, 10, 15 years. That actually may make them more dangerous in zero to three or zero to five, because I think Vladimir Vladimirovich knows he doesn't have any picture cards in his hand either. And that might make him more risk embracing, uh, more willing to take chances in the short term because the, the clock is running, is running against him. In terms of policy, I actually think that calls for a more robust pushback on uh, Russian adventurism. And let me, let me just add to Tom, um, it, it's just not about specific issues. It's not about what about the Russians and what about the Iranians. I was on a panel about two weeks ago now up in Baltimore. It's actually for the Republican members of Congress. And some names you'd recognize on the panel, Ray Odierno, former chief of staff of the Army, Ryan Crocker, uh, our ambassador to every difficult country in, in, in the world, and, and, and Bob Kagan. Robert Kagan from CSAS. And, and Kagan pointed out what's going on here is, is just not, we got a bad actor in Putin, although we do. Mm. We are seeing the meltdown of an international order. And these are now my words, not Bob's. But it's not just a meltdown of the post-World War II American liberal Bretton Woods order. Mm. It is a meltdown of the post-Versailles order in terms of those European drawn boundaries for states like Syria and Iraq, which no longer exist, it may also be a meltdown of the post-Westphalian order, the treaty that ended the Thirty Years' War in 1648, and let me tie that to Russia, all right? Um, the Westphalian definition of citizenship, if you live in X, you're an Xer, okay? Putin has added a, a, a codicil onto that that your, def your citizenship may also be defined by the language your mom and dad spoke in the kitchen while you were growing up. In other words, he feels not just a right, but a responsibility to defend Russian speakers wherever they may be. So, so I, I, what I want to try to describe here is it's not just the bad actor and the specific phenomenon of Russia. It's happening in a global context in which things that we thought were permanent are proving not to be. And, and against that, let's, let's talk a little bit about China because here's, here's Russia under the pressure of sanctions without the ability to access financing in the West, at least now, and uh, then turning to China and doing a series of deals. Let, where, does, where does China fit into this in that context, but more broadly oh, again, yeah. uh, in Asia yeah. and with the, with the islands that have been built where sure. planes are now being landed and so on? So the executive summary yep. is um, I do not see genuine convergence of interests between the Russians and, and the Chinese. There, there may be deals of convenience. Sure. We, we talked at breakfast. Yep. You know, they got financing because they drove a hard deal. 
That's right, and it, it's just it's a pretty good deal. It's Why not just do good it? financially, right? But, there, but there's not a convergence geopolitically. In fact, in fact, if you, if you want to look at divergence, think of a depopulated Russian Far East, tucked up against 1.3 billion very active, energetic, entrepreneurial people, and you'll see. It could be and really as I divergent. understand it, some of that land was originally Chinese. Depends on whose maps you use. <laughs> yes, they had their yeah. version of a. All right. the Mexican-American War, as Absolutely. I recall. So, to, to, to China, as China, N number one, China is not an enemy of the United States of America. There aren't any good reasons for China ever to be an enemy of the United States of America. There are logical, non-heroic policy choices available to us and the Chinese to keep the relationship competitive, <laughs> occasionally confrontational, that, that, that happens, never has to get to the level of conflict. Now, here's the punchline. People with my background, and by the way, I've checked. I've actually asked people of my background in the, in the last month or two. People of my background still fret at least as much, if not more, about Chinese failure as we do Chinese success, Chinese weakness as we do, as we do Chinese strength. Right? Now, there, there are lots of things to be said, said about this, but, but it comes down to what's the legitimacy of one-party rule, which you've already surfaced. And it has nothing to do with Marx, Engels, Lenin, or Mao. It, it has to do with a social contract in which the party says, we get to be autocratic, but don't worry about it. We're going to make you rich. And we'll make all the right decisions on how to manage these markets. That's right. And, and I think the reality is the party is going to have increasing difficulty fulfilling the back half of that bargain. Yeah. And so if, if party legitimacy, I, I, when I do this in a formal context, I have a picture of Xi Jinping with President Obama, and my flippant question is, now who died and made him emperor, <laughs> all right? And if it's, not, if it's not Marxism, and if it's not going to be in the future that economic bargain that has been in the past, what's left to justify party legitimacy and one, uh, one party rule? And unfortunately, the, the only available answer there is nationalism. So you, so you get the Chinese thumping their chest in the East China Sea, the South China Sea, with regard to Tibet, with regard to Taiwan, with regard to, to a whole bunch of things. Graham Allison has written about this. He said this is a classic status quo power, emerging power. We've seen this movie before. We've been in the movie. Graham plays it all the way back to the poor people in Sparta having to deal with those uppity folks over in Athens. All right? And he plays it all the way forward. And he says in the last 500 years of what you and I call the modern world, We've had this emerging status quo thing about two dozen times. We always get from an old equilibrium to a new equilibrium representing the new dynamics of power. The bad news is in about two out of three cases, the mechanism by which we get from the old to the new equilibrium is something that goes by the popular name global war. And so this is, of the global situation, we'll do ISIS, we'll do Vladimir, yep. and so on. This one, this one, Tom, this one's pass fail. Yep. The, uh, and it makes for a, years of, a period of living dangerously uh, and room for miscalculation. Maybe we could round this out with the discussion of China and the legitimacy that you mentioned this morning about their role uh, uh, as a source of, a potential source of stability yeah. in the Middle East. Look, I, I, I would like China to act more like a great power. I would like China to act more like they had vesting in the international system. Now, their complaint is, we didn't make it. I don't, don't, don't know why you're insisting we, we should act like we're, we're vested, all right? Yeah. But uh, we talked this morning about uh, Chinese foreign geopolitical policy being driven by a ruthless mercantilist economic policy. So you go to Darfur, where they're trying to stop the killing. The Chinese are there, too. All they want. All they want is the oil. Okay, that, from our point of view, through our lens, that's irresponsible international behavior by a great power. I would like the Chinese to act more like a great power. And that includes a legitimate growth of Chinese military power to take some of the burden off of our Navy for guaranteeing freedom of navigation for essential commodities in the Straits of Malacca and in the Indian Ocean. Remember where I started, yeah. these guys aren't our enemy. And as a market, uh, a prospective market for the Iranians and the Iraqis and to a degree the Saudis, 
they they have a, a good reason to yeah. care about oh, it. Qu legitimate, and, yeah, yep. that, that, that we need to accommodate. That's part of that emerging status quo equation that we have to solve. And part of the, the, the trip wires of the, where we could, we could trip over uh, could well be making the wrong judgments about some of the moves they've made with respect to how they see enforcing that in the trade routes. Look, uh, well, let me tell you the one, the, the one, that, the one that, really, that really comes to mind are, are they're building those sand castles in yeah. the South China Sea. Yeah. Um, they view the South China Sea to be what they call a core <clears throat> interest. Okay, what are the other core interests? Taiwan, core interest. Tibet, core interest. They, they've got this thing called the Nine Dash Line, which is now the watermark on Chinese passports that shows the, the extent of Chinese territorial claims in the South China Sea. They believe they should be able to treat that body of water the way you and I get to treat Lake Michigan. Mm. All right? All right? That, that is a core interest. We, also, we, the Americans, also have a core interest. Freedom of navigation. It is, it is as core to American geopolitical vision as what I just described yep. for the Chinese. It's really dangerous when two powerful nations have core interests that right now appear to be absolutely incompatible. So watch this space. This is, this is a point that, that could flash. One of the things that occurs to me is some of the knock-on effects that can occur. And in the case of, you know, there's, there's some hope, I suspect, that uh, in fact sanctions will begin to be resolved for Putin. That may be good or bad in some respects, but, but depending on how they respond to, to encourage that. But, but when you think of a million uh, refugees coming out of Syria and, and parts there around that are affected and into Germany, uh, it seems like that would be a real tempting opportunity for the pressure coming from that. Right. Some say 40% of the Germans would now like to see uh, Merkel uh, resigned, um, uh, an ability, something for Putin to take advantage of to accelerate that process. No, he, he's, he's, he's played very cleverly. Yeah. Now, let me give you a thought, all right? Yeah. Um, did, did you ever think that his showing up in Syria was a way to get off stage in front of his nationalistic domestic audience, was a way to get off stage in Ukraine without looking as if he was getting off stage in Ukraine. That's why I was asking. <laughs> yeah. But, but now, but, but now he, he's, he's saying, hey, I can be a useful partner here. You need me. Yep. And no, it's just not the Germans. I mean, our Secretary of State's been burning up the air miles going to Sochi yep. and, and Moscow to, uh, to, to talk to Putin. Those um, weren't vacations? No, <laughs> they were not. Um, I think ultimately American and, and Russian objectives with regard to Syria are incompatible. Yeah. All right. You, 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 I mean, th there may be some tactical advantages. I'm nervous about him, but I can see there may be some tactical advantages close in. But fundamentally, he's about the preservation of some form of the current regime. And I think we believe strongly over here, you can't get to the new Middle East with the preservation of that regime. Let me, let me underscore this, Tom. Iraq and Syria no longer exist. You can probably throw Lebanon in there too. I know you can throw Libya in there too. Yeah. They're all yes. the creation of European it's diplomacy <laughs> 100, 100 years ago. All right, they were always artificial countries. They were always kept in place by the artificial imposition of external power, and I can go through that if you like. But all that external power is gone now, and the internal contradictions are blowing up. All right, they aren't coming back. And any foreign policy on our part that is designed to re-engineer. The, the continued existence of those states, I also think is doomed to failure. Now you've got the Russians who are trying to engineer not just the continued existence of the state, but the continued existence of unwhite minority control. Yeah. That dog ain't gonna hunt. And the third leg of the stool is, is a Russian Walmart port there for their name. Yeah. yeah. That's not it, that I, big? No, I don't think it's that big. Okay. Um, it's, um, I mean, they had a submarine tenor and a few other things there. It's, it's not, it, it, TARDIS is not that big a facility f for the Russians. This is geopolitical. By the way, you, you, you know when Russian arms showed up there last fall? Mm -hmm. That was the first entry of Russian arms and influence into the Middle East since 1973. And I believe they were allowed to enter because somebody else was absent. Yeah. We're talking about a number of vacuums, and that brings to mind Libya. Um, ISIS in Libya is real. Uh, Libya, is, as I perceive it, and I'm asking to be, have it corrected to the degree I misperceive it, uh, there's an east and a west. Uh, on the west, you have uh, the so-called legitimate government, 
that controls the, 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 the uh, financing mechanism and the settlement <laughs> mechanism for oil. On the other side, you've got some, some pretty effective uh, fighters for ISIS and, and a group of others, it's way oversimplified to say one, uh, who are showing that they can control uh, this situation. In the, in the surplus that we're talking about, supply demand today, I put it at about 1.8 million barrels a day, but, but whether Libya can be at 300,000 barrels a day and barely producing, or at the extreme, if you could ever get, uh, get it settled, a million to a million and a half bar barrels a day, you could double that surplus, or you can take it down to where uh, that and normal declines would it, it evaporate by, by Halloween of this year. So uh, how do you see this ISIS in Libya issue uh, yeah, we're, fitting in? We're actually admitting that we're upping our special operations presence in Libya, mm -hmm. trying to organize some of the tribes as opposed to the central government, which we're yep. still not copacetic with, to organize some of the tribes to push back on ISIS. Very tactical, very immediate, very here and now, yep. reduce the immediate danger from ISIS coming across the Mediterranean to, to Southern Europe, organizing attacks yep. uh, here in North America. This is gonna sound intensely political, but I gotta ask you, what were we thinking you know, three or four years ago? Yep. Overthrow, you know, I don't- I, I refer to I, vacuums. So yeah, I, <laughs> I, Candy Crowley asked me once on State of the Union about the, the actions in Syria, and I, or, I'm sorry, in Libya, and I listed some cautions, and she said, so you would have been against it? And I said, well, Candy, these are tough decisions. I probably would have been a voice of caution at the table had I still been in government. And I mean that, these are really hard decisions. But how in God's name can you think that you can overthrow that government and then go away? I mean, if you knew how to point to Libya on a map, you, you knew that this thing was going to disintegrate. And so in for a penny, in for lots of pounds. Yeah, yep. We're gonna, we've got about eight minutes left and uh, when we've got questions, bring them up, Carl, if you would, because I want to, uh, we've touched on some of the points, but if there could be others that you'd like us to have. Thank you. The first question is, how does a scenario of a crash landing, i.e. an economic downturn in China play out in your mind? Yeah, um, back to my ritualistic feel more about fear more failure than success, weakness yep. uh, than strength, because the real answer is we don't know, all right? And, but it would be chaotic, it would be destabilizing. I mean, look, the Chinese have pulled off a miracle. They, they've dragged 400 million people into the middle class. That, that, that's one of the great accomplishments of human history. We should celebrate that. And, and we should foster a continued growth of, of, of that kind of activity. I think the Chinese have great internal contradictions. You already, you already mentioned it, Tom. They, you know, you, they can't get their game to the... The question remains, can they get their economic game to the next level while holding their political game where it is? Yeah. And my answer is no, no I, they, they can't. Exactly, it, 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 it presumes perfect top-down judgment all yeah. the time. Same problem that Russia and the Soviets had, right. where top-down judgment destroyed one of the world's biggest yeah. oil fields, uh, Samet Law. So it would be a great sadness, all right? And, and then beyond that, it would be chaotic and unpredictable, but I don't think anything yeah. is positive. You, you've touched on this already, but maybe just to underscore it, how exactly does China behave as a great power in the Middle East? Hopefully better than the U.S. Is, is the uh, editorial comment. <laughs> Wait, I'm not hey, sure I fully hey, agree back, with that. Back <laughs> off, back off, we're, we're, we're not bad. Um, the, the concept is offshore balancing, yeah. all right? Uh, and, and we've done it since we talked this morning about President Roosevelt and Abdul, Abdul Aziz on the, on the cruiser Quincy and Great Bitter Lake right after Yalda and a few weeks before Roosevelt dies. That's the handshake. You give us oil, we'll give you security. Yeah. And, and we, have, we have been, we took the British, British place, we have been an offshore balancer in that region, for better or for worse, but by and large fairly benign in, in trying, trying to keep some modicum of peace and stability in an incredibly fractured and fractious part of the world. The Chinese can, can help in that regard mm -hmm. as an offshore power, yep. all right? You know, a little weight on this, a little thumb on the scale here, relieve a thumb on the scale there to, to try to keep equilibrium. It would be good if we did that more rather than less cooperatively mm -hmm. and, and not competitively. But they, they, that's a reasonable role for a powerful nation to play. 
And, and, and when I think about, uh, there's a question about can, can the South China Sea situation evolve like the Bosporus? I'm not quite sure what they mean by that, but, but certainly we're, we are looking about contested waters and, um, and we're, we're talking about a situation involving Vietnam for one, the Philippines for another, uh, even Malaysia, uh, as all very uh, disturbed powers who are looking at this perhaps as the U.S. being too weak at the wrong time. So, so a, a couple of dynamics. Uh, the, the, the Chinese are going to lose their legal case, all right? This is chugging through international legal systems. Right. And the Chinese are going to lose their claims, all right? So that's now, ooh, what, what's going to happen there? Uh, the second is, this is destructive of Chinese interests. Um, in my last couple of jobs, I had, I had pretty good insight into Chinese strategic thinking. It's really good. Patient, historic, nuanced, really good. And then I wake up one Sunday morning and they've declared an air defense identification zone over the Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea. I go, what the hell is that about? That is so un-Chinese, mm -hmm. so unproductive. All right? They have been beating their chest so much about the East China Sea that everybody in the neighborhood wants us back. Mm -hmm. You got the Koreans saying, you know, we're, we're, we're cool with 28,000. You, you got the Okinawans saying, we don't mind that F-18 jet noise as much as we used to. Uh, the Filipinos are saying, Subic Bay, Clark, huh? You've been here before. Cameron Bay, maybe. <laughs> oh, no. And the Vietnamese saying, where the hell did you go? We weren't that mad. Okay. <laughs> as, as an advisor in Vietnam, I did yeah. learn something about how they felt yeah. about China. To the we, we've got Navy combatants home ported in Singapore, yeah. and we've got a Marine regiment growing up in Darwin, Australia, none of which should be good news to the Chinese all of which have been created by the clumsiness of Chinese nationalism with regard to their behavior of the past two or three years. One would hope that they, they would scale back, seeing that this really is very counterproductive. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, what was your most memorable uh, and most difficult or memorable day as director of either the NSA or CIA? Well, the most memorable we ain't talking about, <laughs> okay? <laughs> That's still... <laughs> but, but, but That's I, off the record. <laughs> yeah, but, but I, it was the summer of 2007. We had discovered a nuclear reactor nearly completed in the eastern Syrian desert at a place called El Kabar, and we were having a meeting, with, a meeting with President Bush off the calendar. It was not in the West Wing where the things have to be recorded. We were in the residence. We were in the yellow room, which is the room behind the balcony on the second floor when you're looking at the White House from the ellipse across mm -hmm. the South Lawn. And it was all the power ministries, Secretary of State, Defense, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, DNI, CIA, Steve Hadley, National Security Advisor, Attorney General, President, Vice President. And he, he turns to me and says, all right, what do we got? And I said, Mr. President, that's a nuclear reactor. Um, North Koreans and the Syrians have been cooperating on nuclear affairs for about 10 years. North Koreans built it, and this is part of a Syrian nuclear weapons program. And before he could catch his breath, I said, wait, it's a nuclear reactor. Take it to the bank. We actually took our data and gave it to a red team and said, if it's not a nuclear reactor, what is it? Okay, you know, fit all the data into a yeah. hole and, and see yeah. which go up with. Prove it uh, not yeah, to be. Yeah, prove, prove it not to be. And they said, the best thing we can come up with if it's not a nuclear reactor is that it's a fake nuclear reactor. <laughs> okay. So he said, Mr. President, high confidence that's a nuclear reactor. North Koreans and the Syrians have been messing with nuclear things for a decade. We got it. We, we know who's been going back and forth. We know what they do. We know what their degrees are in. Take it to the bank. North Koreans built it. Of course they did. It looks just like Young Beyond. It's based on a British design that no one else has used since 1960. But <laughs> We, we, we aren't there. We aren't eyes on. So I think they did it. Medium confidence the North Koreans built this. And then it's part of a Syrian nuclear weapons program. Of course it is. It's got no other visible use. It's, it's too big for research purposes, and it's not connected to the grid, so it's not going to cre create any electricity. But, Mr. President, I can only give that to you with low confidence because I can't find the other stuff. I can't find the reprocessing facility. I can't, I can't find any weaponization work where they're actually trying to build a warhead. Yeah. At which point, President Bush then said, all right, well, our preemption, my preemption doctrine, 
requires imminent danger to the United States before we take action. Mike just said he had low confidence with regard to it being part of a nuclear weapons program, so we are not going to strike that facility. Now, other people in the room have said, at which point the vice president rolled his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. I do not remember that. <laughs> I, I do remember you the vice president. <laughs> I, I, I do remember the vice president raising some contrary arguments, but but we decided not to strike it. And I was struck about seven months later by another country. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I bring it up because usually intelligence informs a conversation. Intelligence creates the left and right hand boundary of an intelligent discussion. This is the closest one-to-one -one gear ratio I have ever seen between an intelligence briefing and an operational decision. So I remember that one. Thank you very much. What, a, what an insight into decision-making under uncertainty. <laughs> we have another speaker coming up, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.